How much credit does President Bush deserve for finding bin Laden? This was some controversy last week. Zero. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know why that's, a, why that's controversy. The man did nothing about bin Laden until 9-11. And after 9-11, you know, he kind of did it for a few months, kind of. He sent troops into Afghanistan, but didn't tell yeah. them to get bin Laden. No, it, it's amazing when you read the quotes how quickly he went from we have to get bin Laden, this is our focus, to six months later. I don't I, think I don't think about it. It's yeah. just, it is AD. Going after one man, well, you know, what, what's the big well, deal about what that? What I find right. a little baffling about that, though, is when you think about all the risks that were involved in maintaining uh, camps for detainees, when you think about the systematic efforts to seize enemy combatants, I mean, that's obviously riskier than just killing people on the battlefield. And I wonder, I mean, it, it does seem as though they were trying to get a systematic picture of the organization in order to make steady progress in eliminating its leadership. So I'm, he I'm kind took, of confused by he that. He took assets that were looking for bin Laden in Afghanistan. Yeah. He took them out moved of them Afghanistan and moved them yes, to Yes, and Iraq. I think that we can all agree that was a mistake, but the thing is that they were still seizing enemy combatants. They were still fairly active. It wasn't a mistake. Okay. That wasn't a mistake. A mistake is, you know, oops, I parked the car in the, in the Harry, space Harry, you're where absolutely right. It, it deserves this, to be condemned. Was it, was a, a, it was a foreign policy blunder on a historic scale. There you go. But it's also That's true good. that yeah. seizing... That's good. Right. It's also true that seizing... There. Harry, it's also important, you know, why would they have seized these combatants? Why would they have systematically tried to gain a picture of what the organization was like. I mean, that clearly but they, it's a but you steady look at, process you look at of how, building how up. How many of the people that were uh, seized had no usable information, were kept year after year, Absolutely. drivers which, and cooks. Which is a scandal, but the thing is that it was actually very costly. A scandal? It was, a, was it a war crime? Harry, it was... <laughs> come, now. come on now. The issue come is, now. Do, you no. do you see why it's actually a liability to capture people and put them in detainee camps, the way that that would actually... So when you look at the number of drone attacks we see now, it's dramatically stepped up, but the thing is that... Since Obama. Only, right, and yeah. you only have drone attacks. What, the argument is that actually a lot of those are attacking foot soldiers rather than higher-value targets because the sense is that you can't actually gain valuable intelligence from them. Get a lot but, of number threes. Well, right, so <laughs> I think that the issue is... You know, why would they have done this thing that was actually incredibly costly for them diplomatically, et cetera, if because not to actually get a picture of the organization? Effort. Okay. Why would they? They're convinced of that. There are others who disagree. Like, like, like the, they had the whole, I believe it was called Alex Station or Alex Station that was a part of the CIA that was supposed to be dedicated just to finding Os he, um, Osama bin Laden. He closed it. And he, they closed it down. I, I, I never understood that. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for asking this question. It's, it's of you because you'll know the answer. How much of this was luck, ultimately? Really, you talk, you know, really, oh. how lucky, this is a luck game, part of it, no? When, no, you, no. When, when you try to get someone for 15 years, I suppose luck enters into it. But the fact is, CIA was ordered 15 years ago to get this guy, and only got him in August. That's when they f actually found the lead, you know. If you order a pizza and it comes 15 years later, are you going to be happy? <laughs> Yeah, and I would think they would be the first to admit that there is some luck involved. Yeah. And also, I would say, complacency on the part of the target. That's really what it was. He, I, thought, he thought he was protected. Right. No, I, I said it to, the, uh, to uh, uh, Peter Bergen last week when I made the analogy with, uh, in The Godfather when Salazzo says to Michael Corleone, the old man got sloppy. Five years ago, Mike, could I have gotten to him? And that's what it was. Yeah. Well, you know, he got sloppy. You're, you're kind of refuting something that you had said earlier on, right? I mean, if that's true, if the sloppiness was clearly a part of this, it was. I mean, it was something that took a very long period of time, and there were other steps that led to this. This is not to say that the, the current president yeah. doesn't deserve a lot of credit, but it's also true that you needed to have a picture of the organization, and that intelligence was being built. It's really well, about if you want to be people really in the fair. national security bureaucracy who were actually dedicating a lot of time and energy to this. And this was true under the previous president, and this one as well. I think it's less. No, about they were the dedicating president. a lot of time and energy to Iraq. Well, if you want to be really fair, though, the key to him getting sloppy was that he was sitting under the protection of the Pakistani government for Absolutely. five years. So give them credit, too. I think, well, look, I think, that that's, I think that's a huge deal. And I think it's something that we all need to think very hard about. All right. But the, another okay. thing that we need to think hard about is that Pakistan is still there even when we look away. And that's something that we often forget. And we have to understand that their resentments come from somewhere. So yes. I mean, just to throw that out there okay. as the designated brown man. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Uh, let me ask a question on a, a different matter. What do you think, this is for Andrew Ross Sorkin, what do you think of the fact that the banks that were too big to fail during the bailout are now too bigger to fail? A point which is brilliantly raised in the movie. By the way, this movie really, I'm not just plugging it because it's on this network, but it explains what has been murky to me 
<laughs> for all these last couple of years because I'm not a, right. a very good at economics in a way that I felt like even I could understand. Right. Well, no, thank you for that. Um, you know, my worry today is, as you just said, these things are too big to fail. I think they're too big to fail squared. The top 10 banks now control 75% of all bank assets. Just think about that concentration, what that ultimately means. We haven't done anything really about this. All of the legislation's only around the margins, and we really need to figure out structurally what we're willing to do about it. But to me, the biggest problem, and I think you saw it in the movie when you, talked, when you saw it as a human drama about people, these institutions are now not just too big to fail, they're too big to manage. That's the problem. They're so, they're so large, and, and they, by the way, keep getting larger, and the question is how can you physically, as one person, as a CEO or a board or whatever, actually manage these institutions. And that, to me, I think is something that we got to look at and nobody really talks about it but at all. But Andrew, you know, one of the... You, you, you talk about this as if we just haven't developed the will to care or make this happen yet, but you said... The banks are, we, are fighting back, and that's the other problem. We have sent an indelible signal. We have prosecuted no one who helped destroy the American economy. <laughs> Bill Black... Who was the prosecutor in the savings and loan scandal said we the, the regulators sent thousands of referrals to the FBI and to the Justice Department for criminal prosecution, and the major miscreants in the savings and loan scandal went to jail. These guys get more money, their bonuses are bigger, their companies are bigger, they have won. I, I'm we not sent that message. Oh, we've sent that message loud and clear. Yeah. On, on the criminal side, though, I'm gonna say something that's gonna be unpopular and unsatisfying. This may actually be a, a, a crime, meaning a crime against everybody, that isn't actually a fraud. And that, and that is part of the problem. Um, I'm not sure. Right, you, the you problem think, you the, think liars loans weren't frauds? Well, no, I do. I do think some of those were frauds. Yeah. But, but the, I think the, that, the unfortunately, part. they were frauds on both sides, and so the, it makes it much, much more complicated. The crime was when they changed the laws. That's the, the crime. The, the deregulation that led yeah. to something. Getting rid yeah, of glass. That that's was the, the, that's the larger story. That's the problem, is that what they did probably wasn't technically a crime. Right. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, <laughs> panel. Got to go.